it's a blessing and a curse of this time that we've just been through in history that you don't exactly have to squint to see the criming, right? It's all caps out loud, everything with an exclamation point, most of the nouns misspelled, nothing subtle. But of all of the scandal upon scandal upon scandal and the um, people close to the president going to prison, right? And the horrifying irresponsibility of the way that governance was handled and the malevolence and the failure and the mismanagement of, of all that that we have just been through over these past few, past few years, it does still boggle the mind that one of the things we had to rally to as a nation, one of the things we had to rally as a nation to defend from what they were trying to do to it was the post office. I mean, who on earth has it out for the post office? Really? I mean, like as government agencies go, it's like kittens, you know, <laughs> seriously, you're after the mail, you're after letter carriers, your friendly little white Jeeps, meep, meep. How you doing, Mrs. Davis? I've got your mail here. Yes, they came for the post office. Heading into the 2020 election, as President Trump started seeding the idea with his supporters that the election would be illegitimate unless he won, he attacked states that were expanding voting by mail because of the coronavirus pandemic because, you know, presumably that would mean too many people voting. He warned that Republicans would never win an, another election, but with all the voting by mail that was going to happen. He then started this public crusade of attacking the post office like it was some sort of inherently scandalous thing rather than something that we've had in our country since literally the Constitution. The post office founding, the founding language for the post office is in the U.S. Constitution. He railed against the post office like it had been something invented by Obama. He proposed massive cuts to the post office's budget just ahead of the election. He put in charge of the post office. He made post postmaster general a man who had tens of millions of dollars invested in a postal service contractor, a man who had spent his career before his appointment building up his fortune by running companies that contracted with and competed with the post office. Immediately after taking control at the post office, Trump's new postmaster general instituted new policies that instantly led to huge backlogs in the mail, cutting the number of trips that mail carriers were allowed to take, forbidding them from taking any extra trips to move mail even when mail was late. Communities around the country started freaking out when they started unbolting our traditional blue mailboxes from sidewalks and street corners, putting them on flatbed trucks and taking them away to Lord knows where. What are you doing with the mailboxes? Louis DeJoy, as Trump's postmaster general, ordered big, expensive, in some cases, irreplaceable sorting machines that handle millions of pieces of mail very quickly. He ordered those sorting machines removed and destroyed, stripped and left outside for dead. The Louis DeJoy ordered backlogs in the mail were so bad the, the news wasn't just about the, the decline that you could see in the numbers in terms of on-time delivery of regular mail and first-class mail. It was also like horror story stuff, warehouses of late mail becoming basically hazmat sites. Food that had been shipped was rotting in these huge piles of undelivered boxes as the mail stacked up and up and up. Even livestock, animals shipped overnight, ending up dead in transit while the mail backlog built up and up and up and the packages and the envelopes just stacked up in postal service facilities around the country with Louis DeJoy forbidding the postal service to do what they needed to do to deliver them. What is perhaps the most amazing thing about this story, though, even above and beyond the fact that Americans had to rally to try to defend the post office in the middle of everything else we were facing as a country last year? Really? The most amazing thing about this whole story, honestly, looking back at it today, is that the dude's still there. He's still there. He's still running it even after the country lost its mind, including businesses who were really hurt by their shipping and other mailing getting all screwed up, even after the country lost its mind over DeJoy's deliberate sabotage at the post office, his deliberate slowdown and bottlenecking of all the mail and the packages, even after the conflicts of interest he had were exposed, with him maintaining tens of millions of dollars of active investment money in a company doing business with the agency he was then running. He held onto those investments for months after he was running that agency. Even after the Washington Post exposed him as the new Spiro Agnew, <laughs> literally using that same dumb trick where you make the employees handle the cash. 
right, through their own bank accounts and you cover it up with bonus payments to them. And hey, nobody will notice. Even after we learn that that's apparently how he laundered the gazillions of dollars he paid to Republican politicians and how those donations were, in fact, how he got himself appointed by Trump to run the post office and to run it into the ground. Even after all of that, right now, as we sit here tonight, dude is still there. The dude is still running the post office. He is still postmaster general, even after all that. Because of the way that that part of the government is structured, President Biden can't necessarily just fire Louis DeJoy and be done with it. Now, if Mr. DeJoy were ever indicted for the fake bonus scheme, would that change? Would he then become fireable under the rules that govern these things? I don't know. It's never come up before. (laughs) But that hasn't happened at this point. We don't know. But the guy is still there. And even since President Biden has been in office, he is still proposing and enacting even more cuts to the post office than what he did last year. It's just astonishing. But now, happy Friday night. Finally, after all this time, it would appear that the Biden administration has finally figured out how they might solve this problem and how to save the post office in the process. Finally, President Biden is in the process of filling all of the vacant governor seats on the Postal Service Board. There's just one more open seat. There is a nominee for that seat awaiting final final confirmation. When that seat is filled, uh, the majority of the seats on the Postal Service Board will be held by or appointed by Democrats, including independent Amber McReynolds, That means that Ms. McReynolds and her new colleagues will have some very consequential decisions to make in very short order. Joining us now is the newest member of the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors, Amber McReynolds. Ms. McReynolds, thank you so much for for being here. I really appreciate you making the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rachel. Uh, One of the things that um, I think was um, just sort of a shocking turn in the um, public sphere last year um, was when Americans across the spectrum and across the country felt like they needed to come to the defense of the Postal Service. Um, the president at the time lambasting the Postal Service, denouncing it as some sort of scheme or something that was stacked against him or something that should be done away with. Um, we saw draconian changes to Postal Service policies that had real impact on the ground in terms of slowing down uh, the mail and hurting a lot of businesses, um, freaking out a lot of people in the country in terms of what was going to happen with our ballot applications and our ballots when it came to voting by mail, in addition to everything else that we do by mail. I think a lot of people in the country right now are surprised to know that the postmaster general from that era is still in place. And I think people are worried that his policies might have permanently sort of kneecapped the Postal Service so that it's not going to be able anytime soon to get back to the levels of service that we were used to and to it being a a non-controversial, well-supported part of American public life. I guess I want to ask, given your incredibly important role now on the Postal Service Board of Governors, If you feel that, um, if you're aware of that consternation in the country, and if you can give people any assurance that these things might get better. Well, I'm certainly aware of it. And, you know, I think that there's a culmination of issues that occurred, uh, the pandemic certainly being one of them. I mean, the Postal Service has a frontline critical infrastructure workforce that continue to deliver mail and packages Uh, packages, by the way, in record numbers. Uh, And because they've, you know, a lot of that equipment has been underinvested in, especially on the package front, there were backlogs and businesses experienced that and people experienced that with their medications. Um, And so those are things that now, now that the 10 year plan has been, has been put out there. uh, Once I'm, once I join the board and have obviously more access to the information that current board members have, uh, those are, those are things that I'm going to certainly focus on in terms of service because service has to be effective. It has to be universal. Uh, the Postal Service is one of our most admired institution institutions. It connects businesses and commerce to people and customers. It connects government to the people and services and vice versa. And it ensures that people can access their medication. And in some parts of the country, like Alaska, and I just spoke to Senator Murkowski about this, uh, people rely on the Postal Service as their grocery store, their hardware store, their bank, uh, and everything else. Their, their vote by mail ballots and election information. And that post office is a lifeline to many communities around the country. 
Uh, and so it has to be effective and it's in the constitution that it needs to deliver a universal service. And so service is one of my key priorities. Uh, it's been my priority in the election administration world. Uh, the parallels between the postal service and election administration are very obvious. Uh, there's been a lack of uh, investment in technology and innovation over time. Uh, there's often funding issues, which is the same in election administration. Uh, there's seasonal workforce issues. So the, the sort of expansion and retraction, both of those things are, are parallel in both of those worlds. Um, and then of course there's policy issues. There's policies that have tied the postal service uh, to not being able to, to keep up financially. Um, and we have to address those things. And uh, and I look forward to joining the board uh, to think about these things in a creative and strategic way uh, and certainly bring my expertise from the election administration world because I truly believe there's a whole, a whole host of opportunities for the Postal Service to further improve their operations in partnership with local and state government, especially on the elections front. Uh, and there's huge opportunities to do that going forward. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.